The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, it's Bree here from Lacos. Just doing a very quick sound check. Um, if you can hear me or you're having any troubles or if I sound like Mickey Mouse, can you just send us a little message through your little chat box or your questions panel there and just say, all okay if everything's good? Or if you've got any problems, just send those through and we'll quickly try and troubleshoot those while I'm in the room. Good, Trisha's good. Excellent. Thanks, Kate. Okay. okay. Great. Excellent. So we will get started. So I'd like to introduce you to Kylie, who is your facilitator for today, and Leela, who is our community resilience and relief officer. Um, she will be fielding your questions for today. So any questions that you have during the PowerPoint presentation, um, feel free to just send through like you've just done with the sound check and Leela will be able to feel, feed those through to Kylie during the presentation and um, Kylie can answer all your questions. So without further ado, I think we'll get going. I'll Thanks. leave it to you two. Thanks, Bree. Hi, everyone. My name's Kylie. Um, and as Bree just mentioned, we've got Leela in the room as well. Um, we haven't been able to quite figure out how to get all of us talking at the same time. And to be honest with you, it's been a bit of a struggle in the past, <laughs> um, having quite a few people on. So um, we've got you in listen mode only, which means if you do have questions to ask, you just need to type them through to Leela. Um, and it would be great to have questions come through. So please do feel free to just, um, you know, you don't need to wait for a certain point. You can just type them whenever it occurs to you um, and we'll pick them up as we go. Um, and we have, we do have a couple of questions that were asked beforehand. Uh, so yeah, I'll weave those throughout the presentation as we go. Uh, and just also for any anyone that may be um, wondering about the timing. So it is an hour and a half presentation today. I think maybe the try booking link had um, had two hours. So just to be clear that we're just looking at an hour and a half and we'll finish up at 3.30. Okay, I think we'll get started. And it's um, an interesting scenario when we're in a webinar because I want to acknowledge country, but we're not technically meeting physically on country right now. But Leela and I are meeting here together. So I do just want to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the original custodians of the land in which we meet today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, but also uh, to the elders past, present and emerging on all the lands in which you are currently joining us from. So we're going to talk about outcomes measurement today. Um, okay. Sorry, just a slight difficulty in moving the slides along. Great, okay. Um, but before we get into the content, I just wanted to raise what Wacos is for anyone that may not be aware, although <laughs> given a lot of you will have signed up through uh, the Community Resilience Program, you probably know what Wacos is. Uh, but Wacos is the peak body for community service organisations in Western Australia. We do quite a few different uh, things. Sorry, we're flicking. I'm just going to turn off the transitions or make sure they're turned off. So, so Wacos, uh, we do a number of different kind of projects and uh, we do a lot of advisory and consultancy work. We run trainings like this webinar, uh, but we also do quite a bit of work around advocacy with the government, co-design initiatives and other projects, anything that really can support community service organisations to do their jobs better. Uh, so any any further questions about Wacos, we can address that later, but uh, that is Wacos. And this is me. And sorry, I should also mention we're recording today, so I will try to remember now to tell you um, if you're listening to the recording instead. Uh, as I swap to a new slide. So currently we're on the slide that has my name at the top, Kylie Hansen, and this is just to give you a bit of a snapshot of my experience. Um, uh, quite a lot of the work since I uh, started working with the Delivering Community Services and Partnership Policy, which I'll talk a bit about later in 2012, has revolved around outcomes and outcomes measurement. Uh, so I, I, I hope I can add some value to you and your organization's measurement strategy. Uh, and please do feel free, as I said, to send questions through as as you want to. And Leela can also feel free to ask questions as they occur. 
So in terms of what we're going to go through today, uh, some introductory concepts, the kind of the what, the why, the definitions and levels and types of outcomes. So delving into what we mean in terms of the terminology of outcomes. We're going to talk a bit about logic models and you would have got the uh, logic model activity that came out um, as a handout beforehand. If you didn't, please do just um, message Leela, but she's currently out of the room, so she'll pick it up when she gets back. Uh, but then we're going to go through some of the answers to that. So I'll give you a couple of minutes while we're in the webinar to, to, um, to go through and think about that yourself first, and then we'll go through some of the answers to that. And then I want to go from the articulation or the logic around outcomes through to the measurement of outcomes. So actually talking a bit about different methodologies and approaches to measuring outcomes. Uh, and so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a taster of the different kinds of ways that organisations are, are thinking about measuring outcomes. I've got a couple of notes on indicators and collecting data, uh, but we're just going to see where we get to with an hour and a half. And because I would really like to make sure I answer any questions that came through and also the questions that have already come through. Uh, so we'll see where we get to. Uh, but towards the end of the session, I can also just um, um, let you know about other training opportunities and things that Waycos does, because this is a very short taster session. And we also do uh, I guess sort of half day and full day training sessions on outcomes and so if that's a thing that your organization's interested in um, Wakeless can help you out with that. So an outcomes journey. Next slide for those that are coming and sometimes it can feel a little bit like this. <laughs> um, the, the outcomes are not uh, a super simple concept and particularly once you start to delve into the measurement of outcomes it can be really hard to figure out where you are and then when you figure out where you are sometimes you think it's okay I'm on the right track I'm getting this and then you learn a bit more and then you'll think oh my goodness actually I don't know what I need to start with <laughs> so don't feel discouraged or um, I guess like you're alone if, if that's the feeling that you have around outcomes it is challenging but it is something that is entirely possible and we can make it um, simple and I think sometimes in our minds we can complicate it and we can complicate it with what funders are asking of us and a whole bunch of other things uh, so yeah just to be aware that you're not alone if this is how you feel when you think about outcomes you might think it's a bit of a mess and you have no idea how to go about it for your organization uh, but just to say that we can we can make this work let's start the journey together and we can support you to be able to get there why we're talking about outcomes. So this is the next slide. So talking about outcomes is consistent with the mission of us as not-for-profit organisations and community organisations. You know, we want to achieve the best possible outcomes for the people we're working with and for the communities that we're working in. It also assists in organisational planning and the allocation of resources. Uh, and one, one point I'd like to make here is that oftentimes we can think about the strategic plan of our organisation um, and think about that quite separately from how we're measuring outcomes. In fact, really, we should be thinking about how these things come together. So how the mission, the vision, the mission and the values of our organisation kind of in a in a hierarchy sort of form, how are they our North Star? How's that our, you know, our touch point, our source of truth? And how then do we cascade down with indicator, the outcome, sorry, um, and the kinds of indicators that help us understand what kind of work we're achieving as an organisation. So it's probably one thing to, to think about if you're in a position to be thinking about the strategy of your organisation is how it does align with the outcomes measurement frameworks that you're putting in place. Finally, we're also talking about outcomes because it's come up quite a lot in terms of our funding and resourcing uh, contexts. So we've had a, kind of a push to outcomes-based procurement reform since the implementation of the Delivering Community Services and Partnership Policy, at least at a state level. We have had discussions about what outcomes measurement looks like at a federal level as well. Um, and even some local governments are starting to examine outcomes hierarchies or outcomes measurement frameworks. Uh, so I think also when we think about philanthropists and you know funding that we might get from um, foundations, they're also thinking a bit about how they properly measure impact, which is usually taking an outcomes-based approach. So there's a few different um, ways and reasons, I guess, why, why we have this discussion about outcomes and outcomes measurement. And the DCSP policy, which is the policy I referred to before, sorry, next slide for those uh, listening to a recording. 
Uh, these are up here on the slide are the principles of outcomes-based contracting. Uh, so rebalancing the nature of the relationship between the public and not-for-profit sectors, and that was actually what the DCSP policy was trying to achieve overall. It wasn't focused on procurement reform necessarily. It was actually, it came out of the kind of Productivity Commission um, and Economic Audit Committee sort of times, and it was focused a bit more about rebalancing that nature of the relationship. Um, also focusing on the achievement of outcomes, improving services, acknowledging the importance of the partnership with the not-for-profit sector in terms of planning, design and delivery of human services, um, reducing admin burden. I think uh, oftentimes what I hear from organisations is we haven't made a lot of <laughs> traction in that, in that area and ensuring services are funded and procured in a sustainable manner. And I know also, you know, there's a, a long way to go in that last one, but I think the shift to three to five year um, service agreements has been an element of ensuring we've got that um, sustainable procurement. So, you know, I think in some sectors we have seen uh, quite a bit of shift on the last point. But all of these are principles of outcomes-based contracting and uh, I guess, you know, within the state context at least, these kind of are governing um, the state government's approach to how we are looking at this. Any questions yet? No? No, yet. Don't forget to send three questions. I'm more than happy to answer them at any time. All right, so when we're talking about outcomes, the first point I'd make is that context is really critical. So you've got population or community level outcomes. So these are the kinds of outcomes that refer to a, a cohort or a community at a, a quite a high level, high aggregated level. So, for example, the community of Coburn. Uh, or you know people who, with an experience of mental health um, issue, or people experiencing a disability, or people with a disability in the city of Coburn. So it's looking at, um, I guess, a cohort of people, whatever way you describe them, at, at quite a high population or community level. The next level down from that is program, service, or organisational level outcomes. So these are outcomes that are still at a level of aggregation. Um, so, you know, in, in the context of a particular organisation, we might be thinking about outcomes that the organisation is trying to achieve. So there might be things, as we mentioned before, in the strategic plan. Um, for government, for state government, uh, the higher level of aggregation might be looking at a service. So, for example, all financial counselling contracts um, and what are the outcomes in, in that service. So these are outcomes still at a level of aggregation but not quite as high as the population or community level outcome. And then you've got individual level outcomes, which are outcomes that uh, I guess individuals want to achieve for their own lives and that ideally we, we hopefully are supporting them to do that. Um, but also individual outcomes, it might be an organisation thinking about what we're looking for at an individual level. So we could look at it from either of those perspectives. It's important to know that individual level outcomes uh, may comprise, a, I guess, a, a step along the way to one of these program or service level or population level outcomes. Um, but equally, the things that individuals want to achieve for themselves are sometimes not properly accounted for in program or service or organisational level outcomes. Um, so it's important to be aware of that. It's also important to be aware that, uh, for example, a, a program or service level outcome might be a step along the way to a community level outcome, or it might be an indicator of a community level outcome all the individual outcomes might be an indicator of one of those other aggregations. So there's a lot of different ways that these things can fit together, but I think some of the time, and you know, if you've started in your journey of outcomes, you will have had this debate of, is that an output or is that an outcome? And I think sometimes it's because we're not being clear and having a shared understanding of the context that we're talking about. Uh, because you know, some of these can be outputs or short-term outcomes towards a, a bigger picture outcome. But it's just, you know, are we are we being very clear about it in the specific context we're in? If anyone can hear that, it's Bree's birthday today, so we've got some singing of happy birthday outside our door. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll let her know you joined in, you know. So that's the context stuff, and I think that's really important to have a shared underst understanding in terms of whether we're looking individually at our organisation and, and the um, understanding we have as, as staff of what level we're talking about, or in a conversation with our funders, so with state government or with other funders, being clear about what uh, what level of outcomes we're talking about at any point in time. I think that can help some resolve some of the issues we've had, um, you know, in the discussion and debate around outcomes. Any? The next slide is a program logic model. Uh, usually, if I had you in front of me, I'd ask if anyone was aware of this, but it's a little bit awkward to do that. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, are people familiar with program logic models? Just type an answer in. Yes, no, a little bit, not really. Okay. The popular. I've got a. I've got a question oh. here from Sherilyn um, McMeekin. She's asking from population to organization to individual outcomes. Shouldn't the arrows go up, not down? Sure. That that might be a design flaw that I have going on there, Sherilyn. Um, well, I mean, in a sense, so, yeah, so if I take your, your question all the way through, yes, so individual outcomes might aggregate up to program or service outcomes, which might aggregate up, so in a reporting perspective, but I think in an articulation perspective, sometimes we're starting with what are the population or community level outcomes we're looking for, and so how do we chunk them down, right, to, to a lower level aggregation, and then chunk that down to individual. But I totally take your point. I think, like, you, you know, I'm really just sort of saying it kind of could make sense from an articulation perspective, but I think from a measurement perspective, you're totally right. It would need to speed up. Yeah. And out of 33 people, we have one, two, three, four people who have used um, uh, Project Logics before, have some experience with them. Sure, yeah, there's great. more in there. Yeah, there's probably more in there. Just not, just not sharing with us at this point. Or you've stepped away from your computer, <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, so a program logic model is effectively a way of articulating outcomes. So if I start at the left-hand side, actually, do you know what? I'm going to start at the right-hand side because I tend to like to start with the long-term outcome or impact. So um, theoretically, we're thinking about, you know, uh, what are the conditions, what are the social, economic, and environmental conditions that we're trying to achieve as, as organisations, as communities, as, you know, whatever kind of row we we want to use um, in order to get to that kind of impact that that state that we're looking to to influence what needs to change is action it's behavior it's people doing things it's decisions being made differently so um, an action oriented outcome is often described as the medium term outcome on the way to that longer term outcome or impact in order to shift that action, to have people doing things differently or making decisions differently, we need to have a shift in learning, in awareness, um, in you know knowledge, in motivation or opinion, whatever it is that needs to shift from a kind of a, um, a knowledge or learning perspective, that's usually what's articulated as a short-term outcome, which then impacts on the medium-term outcome, which is the action shift, which then impacts on the longer-term impact. Uh, so the, you know, those social, and economic, or environmental conditions we're looking to shift. If I move backward then to the green box, so we've got outputs uh, here. So you've got outputs divided by activities and by participation. Some logic models actually present activities as a separate box. So you have your inputs, your activities, and then your outputs as a result of doing those activities. Um, this one kind of groups them together. So we've got uh, activities of the stuff that we're actually doing. Are we delivering counselling sessions? Are we delivering a certain kind of program or service? Um, are we developing products, curriculums and things that are being delivered to people? Um, are we running workshops in kind of the same way we're doing here? Um, and then the output of that is how many people did we reach? So, you know, uh, 42 or something people registered for this workshop at, I don't know, 30 or something. Uh, 33. Up. 33 turned up, yeah. Um, but that's an output, right? So that's the number of people that we've been able to reach in this particular scenario. But here it would be, you know, the number of people who access your service or your program. Satisfaction um, down at the blow of the participation box is an interesting one because some, uh, and we'll go through this when we look at the methodologies, but some methodologies look at satisfaction and quality, I guess, in a sense, a bit differently to um, to other methodologies. So. Um, satisfaction, in a sense, is 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 an output, but it's a, a kind of a hard one. It doesn't fit within the traditional program logic sort of model. Um, you've got a whole bunch of inputs there. So this is the stuff that we put in to be able to do those activities, to receive the outputs that that we talked about, which then lead to those short, medium, and long-term outcomes. Um, so inputs can be staff, volunteers, time, uh, money, etc. Um, there's a whole bunch of contextual stuff that sits around the program logic, which I won't really go through in this session, but if you have particular questions, please feel free to, to send them. Um, the only other point that I would want to articulate here is uh, what a theory of change is. So I think oftentimes we can use theory of change and program logic model quite interchangeably, and you've probably heard people refer to this as a theory of change. Um, none of that's like 
technically incorrect, I suppose, but I think there's a difference between what the logic is of the activities and the sequencing of them, I guess, and what the underlying theory of change is. So usually, like, what a theory of change is saying is um, if we have these kinds of inputs, we can do these kinds of activities, and if we do these kinds of activities, that will lead to these kinds of outputs, and if we have these kinds of outputs, we believe, we understand, we know, ideally according to evidence, evidence-based practice, that it will lead to these short-term, medium-term and long-term outcomes. So the theory of change is kind of like what underpins the logic model in terms of a, uh, I nearly went to say belief system there, and true, it could be a belief system, but ideally it's backed up by evidence. So we know, you know, there's evidence and research that suggests that if you create uh, the environment to have these learning and awareness outcomes that will lead to a certain kind of action in you know whatever 75 80 percent of cases so ideally you've got evidence that underpins this um, and yep. so that's what I would say there the theory of change and program logic and whether or not they're interchangeable terms Can I ask a question yeah go with okay so you went from long-term outcomes mm -hmm. and sort of tracked backwards, Indeed. which sort of feels a little counterintuitive mm -hmm. and it's sort of hard to get my brain around. Yeah, sure. So what's the value in thinking backwards? So in terms of me thinking backwards? Well, I don't think you're the only one that does it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, I guess like to my mind, it just makes sense to go, what's the bigger picture vision that we're trying to achieve and how do we chunk down the, uh, the steps along the way, in a sense, to get to the bigger picture. Mm. But I totally, and you know, this is why it's called a program logic model, guys. It totally makes sense to start from inputs. I guess when I've described it just now, I've started at the end and worked backwards. But absolutely, in terms of a, a logic model, it makes sense to logically begin at the inputs or, you know, at the context, the inputs, the outputs, and the outcomes. So, yeah, it's a very, very good question. Thank you, Leela. Any other questions that have come um, up? I've got no more ask for cool. some. Yeah, great. All good. Send them through when you're ready, people. Uh, so that's a program logic model. Uh, and so the measurement then takes places a whole bunch of different stages yeah. and different levels. And for those listening, we've just moved on to the next slide. So you've got your planned work and you've got your intended results. So we can be measuring, um, in a sense, the work that we've planned. We can be measuring the inputs. Um, so the resources that have gone into it, and you know, it's pretty easy. We know the number of dollars or the number of staff hours. We know what's being put into the project. And oftentimes where, uh, you know, where that becomes most important is when you're looking to compare that to the kind of outcome um, that, we're, that we're achieving. Um, but I'll come back to that when we go through the measurement side of it. I'm just trying to, I guess, in a sense, focus on the articulation. Then you've got the activities. So we can measure the activities that are provided. We know what kinds of things we've done. We know how many counselling sessions we've provided. We know how many workshops we've facilitated. We know, um, you know, uh, how many hours we've spent on a particular kind of program. Well, that's kind of an input as well. <laughs> um, and so it's very contextual in terms of articulating a logic that goes alongside this. And then we can obviously measure outputs. And I think oftentimes when we're thinking about um, how we report, how we understand what we're doing as organisations and how we report to people who want to know what we're doing, usually funded. Um, this is where a lot of our measurement takes place, right? So we know um, how many people attended a session that we've run, like a parenting session. We know how many people have attended um, you know, particular kind of counselling sessions. Um, we know how many young people have gone into this particular camp that we run. So we know that sort of stuff, right? Bree's just brought us birthday cake. Sorry, everyone. If I could figure out how to take a photo of you for you, I would. Yeah. I just happy birthday, Bree. Everyone wants to tell you happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so outputs are really easy to measure, and oftentimes that's probably why we focus there because they're easy outcomes. As we've kind of started to unpack, are a little bit harder. And so then we can also be measuring our intended results. So we can be looking at the immediate effects and outcomes, so the behavioural, the learning and the behavioural changes that we're hoping to achieve, so those short, medium-term outcomes, and the impacts of the longer-term and more fundamental outcomes that we're looking for from whatever it is we're doing, the program, service, initiative, et cetera. So, you know, measurement can take place theoretically at all of those levels, right? Um, but I guess in an outcomes-based approach, we're trying to orient our measurement more towards the intended result than we are trying to measure the planned work. Uh, and 
this is just a little bit of a different way of articulating that sort of yeah we got a question i've got a question amazing i've got a question from kate jones um i have found that sometimes capturing unintended results can be useful whether they are positive or negative totally agree kate um, and I might just finish my thoughts on this slide and then I will come loop back to that because I think it's a really important point that you make. So what this slide, so sorry, for those listening on recording, we've moved on to the outputs, outcomes and impact slide. Uh, so this slide articulates the end point of the program logic in just a little bit different way. So again, we've got the outputs and we can be thinking about outputs in terms of the um, participation and engagement kind of metrics that we talked about in when we had the program logic slide up. And then you've got the outcomes and impacts. So you've got that sort of theory of change that underpins your learning outcomes, your action outcomes, and then the impact, you know, the bigger picture, what we're trying to achieve stuff. And really what we're interested in is the change relative to the baseline or the counterfactual. And so I want to talk about baseline, counterfactual, and unintended consequences that Kate just brought up. So um, the baseline is effectively a term for um, what would have happened to those people that we've supported. So I'm just sorry, that's not the right thing. <laughs> what what uh, what position are those people that we've supported in as when they come to the service? So at point in time before we have provided um, an intervention, uh, you can't see when I use um, air quotes, which is difficult. Um, so when we've provided our service or program or whatever, whatever it is that we do, um, what what are those people like at the point that they come to us? Now. Uh, for those of you that work in services with uh, vulnerable people, you would realise that if someone comes in for counselling, we're not going to be like, hey, just before I start providing you the, the you know, support that you so desperately need, I need to ask you some questions about, you know, your mental health. Um, we don't do that, you know, we provide the service. That's what we're there for, a service provider. So um, it can be really difficult to get a baseline, particularly for um, some kinds of services and programs. The counterfactual is what would have happened otherwise. So, uh, you know, if those people hadn't accessed your service or your support or your organisation, um, what would have otherwise happened? Like what would their journey have looked like otherwise? Um, and this can be uh, slightly easier to collect information on, although I'd argue for um, small organisations it's just as hard. Um, so you can kind of look to um, other communities or other um I don't know, like other statistics, like the ABS, what's happening with the population anyway. Um, but this is important because um, humans are resilient. So if they didn't access our program or service or support, um, probably they would have found something else. I know sometimes we, we don't like to be clear about that, um, but it's entirely possible that that would have happened, right? So um, the counterfactual and the baseline help us with understanding um, you know, the attribution or the causation of, of the service that we're providing. Unintended consequences are really important too because sometimes they help you um, kind of figure out what's happened in your underlying theory of change. Um, so sometimes if you've got your theory of change, um, you might have results that either, you know, support that or you might have results like, you know, completely unintended things happening which you hadn't anticipated. And so unintended consequences, and as Kate says, they're really good and interesting anyway and I think in terms of providing um, measurement for your programs and services, they provide, sorry, they demonstrate to funders that you're really interested actually in the impact you're having because you're collecting other things as well. But beyond that, they can also help to inform your theory of change. So, you know, you've done the work, you've figured things out, think why, why did that happen? What happened there? Maybe there's something, you know, that's wrong in our theory of change. Maybe if you have these kinds of outputs, it doesn't necessarily always lead to these short-term outcomes. Or if you have these short-term outcomes, maybe that doesn't always lead to those medium-term outcomes. So it can help you to refine the theory of change that underpins your um, your, your kind of your logic. Any other questions? Yeah, we've yeah. got a comment here from Arita Ellis. She says, we refer to it as triage assessment based on risk assessment matrix, typically observation based depending on the level of engagement. Totally. Yeah. Good one. Sorry, what was <coughs> Arita? Arita. Yeah, good one, Arita. I think that's a really good point. So oftentimes we will do kind of some sort of assessment that is observation based. So the case manager or whoever it is that's um, welcomed the person initially into the service or program can provide a bit of the sense of that baseline information that we're talking about. Um, and I, like honestly, I think that that's awesome. Like I think if we can do that and people have the time to, to do that, 
that's excellent. Um, I think from a very like purist, academic, robust sort of perspective, it's still not like technically a baseline, right? But, you know, I, I'm very much of a, a practitioner perspective when it comes to measurement um, and doing what we can with the culture and the resources and, you know, what we have available to us. So I think I'm um, exactly like Arita said, if you if you can do something that is is good enough and you're just clear about what you've done and the reasons why and the assumptions underpinning that, I think that's awesome. Yeah. Any other? Arita says there? okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so we're moving on to the next slide for those listening, which is outcomes are a piece of cake, uh, which I have in front of me, which I'm not going to be able to eat until I stop talking to you guys. Uh, so this effectively is a slide that someone actually shared with me and said, hey, like, I really like this is a simple way of explaining the program logic. Um, so I've inserted it into the presentation. So thank you. I should actually remember who <laughs> shared it with me and acknowledge them. Uh, so in terms of a cake, you've got the inputs, you've got the ingredients, utensils and the recipe. Um, so for a program, we've got the money, staff, resources and time. Um, the activities are for a cake, obviously, measuring, mixing, baking, icing and slicing, which Bree's done an excellent job here for cake. Isn't that interesting, guys? We actually make the person whose birthday it is bring in the cake. Like, I know it makes sense from the perspective of, you know, people like different cakes, but, you know, if it's your birthday, shouldn't someone bring a cake for you? Kate, we actually have a legal cake act. Oh, it is a ridiculous, yeah, cake act. Um, so if anyone wants a template of the cake act, we can make that available to you following the webinar. Um, so the activities also on the project then are delivering counselling sessions. The output is cake for 10 people. Um, but the outcome is 10 people are happy and full. So then on the um, project side of things, the output is that 10 people have received counselling, but the outcome is that 10 people are well, maybe happier or more confident rather than just confident, happy and healthy. Um, but, you know, so the, the, the outcome in a sense is, is a result of asking, but, you know, what for, for what purpose? So after you have the output, you've got cake for 10 people. That's great, but for what purpose? Like what are we doing with it? Well, people can then be happy and full. And similarly with the counselling session, like you've received counselling, that's great, but what for? What what's the what for what purpose? Well, hopefully you can be healthier and happier and more confident. So I, I do want to make a statement that um that out that that's it, you know in terms of the technical again robust technical uh, academic definition around outcomes, it is kind of the highest level that you can go to in asking that what for question. Um, in terms of when I say actually it depends on the context, that's not a very technical definition of outcomes, right? But I'm going to explain to you, hang on, let me just check the next slide. Um, yeah, so I just, yeah, I'll explain it here. I think what otherwise what happens if we effectively say, okay, as an organisation, um, you, your, your outcome is effectively something around access, right? Um, so you're looking for... Well, let's use free delivery as an example. If you're looking at the outcome um, and your entire focus as an organisation is mostly around access to food. So, of course, you understand the reasons why you want to see access to food, right? Of course you do. Um, and that will hopefully form the vision and mission and the values of you as an organisation, right? But if we're saying, well, actually, access is not an outcome, access is like an, uh, an output or it's a short-term outcome, it's not a long-term outcome, if we say that to that organisation, it kind of, in a sense, prevents you from using the full logic model. So we're saying that your, your impact stops here, like stops at output or short-term outcome. So it means that the logic of the expanded kind of um, logic model um, can't be properly used by that organisation by saying that's where you stop. So that's the only reason I kind of say, look, it's contextual and it depends on where you are and what the program logic is that underpins, you know, where you are and what you're trying to achieve as an organisation. So I think otherwise, in a sense, with outcomes measurement, you're cutting yourself at the knees, right? Or we're cutting ourselves off or whatever the right term for that is. So just to explain that, in a very, like, robust and ideal universe, not ideal, I think in just a more robust and academic, you know, frame of mind, the outcome very technically is... is um, yeah, it's like the bigger picture things, right? The what for, asking the what for questions. Uh, so we've gone over to the next slide, flexibility and structure. So this is just to say that logic model, the one I've shown you, looks very linear um, and it looks, uh, you know, very step-by-step -step and clinical. Um, there's a lot of different ways of presenting logic models um, and, and the logic model in and of itself is it doesn't have to be linear. Like there's a lot of loops around, there's a lot of coming back into this, there's a lot of this informs that. Uh, it's really just a way of providing clarity around the articulation 
of what you're trying to achieve and how your activities support you to do that, in effect. Has anyone got any questions before we have a, the logic model lingo exercise? Dr. Right, so what I'm going to do here is just like give us maybe three minutes. No, maybe that's not long enough. We'll see how we go. Let's go somewhere between three and five minutes to have a look at that handout that I sent you, the logic model lingo one, and just play, um, you know, kind of rank the things. So this is the one that says uh, the elements are teens learn new leadership skills, a new curriculum was developed all the way down, right? So the idea is you place a one if it's an input, you place a two next to it if it's an output, either an activity output or a participation output. And then you put a 3A if it's one of those short learning outcomes, short term learning outcomes. Um, 3B if it's a medium term outcome, like action oriented. And 3C if it's a long term ultimate benefit kind of outcome. So what I'll do is just, you know, I'll stop talking for three to five minutes. But as you finish, if you can just type into Leela like I'm done or, you know, I've had enough time, then that just gives me a sense of when quite a few people are done and we and we will pick it up again. So just three to five minutes to fill that in now, just based on what we've talked about in this first sort of section.
All right. So don't worry too much if you're not all the way down the list. I don't want to, I just don't want to have the webinar sit on silent for just so long. <laughs> um, and for those that have finished, and um, we'll start making our way through. Um, and, you know, the point here is that, well, look, I think we'll get to the point. So we'll just start and see how we go. So if you can type your answer into Leela, um, we're not going to say who it's, you know, come from or any of that stuff. Just, you know, just gives a little bit more interaction than just me talking at you. We have a so, question. Oh, okay. Um, can you please clarify assumptions and external factors? Yeah, definitely. I haven't, um, yeah, so not on the activity, so assumptions no. and external factors. So I might just flip back into PowerPoint so everyone knows where we're at. Oh. Yeah, okay. So um, assumptions is um, a really important one to like, be really clear about. So sometimes, you know how we talked about the theory of change and hopefully that is, uh, I guess, underpinned by evidence or informed by evidence if it's not evidence-based, at least evidence-informed, um, which is sometimes a useful distinction to make if we don't have the really, you know, robust studies and things that means we can say something's evidence-based, then at least we can say evidence-informed. So maybe some of the research exists, but it's not all the way there in terms of, um, you know, knowing it with some certainty. So assumptions then are probably one step back further from evidence-informed. Like they're kind of assumptions that you're making around the, um, you know, around the if we have these inputs, we can do these activities. Well, that's probably not a good example, sorry. If we have these um, activities, it will result in these kinds of outputs. And then if we get these kind of outputs, it will lead to these kinds of learning outcomes. And therefore, these kind of learning outcomes lead to these kinds of, um, you know, uh, action outcomes. So that theory that underpins that, sometimes you're going to be assuming stuff. Um, and it's important to be really clear when we're assuming stuff. I'll talk a bit about, um, not a lot, but we'll touch on social return on investment in a little bit. And that methodology of looking at outcomes is, um, is very much about clarity of assumption. So it acknowledges that we don't live in a perfect universe. We can't know everything for certain. So if we're making assumptions or leaps of logic in our underlying theory of change, just being really clear about it. External factors then are things that can impact on these things. So Again, in a perfect world, if we deliver our program or service or whatever it is in exactly the way intended, um, you know, maybe it would lead to these short, medium, long-term outcomes. But stuff happens, right? Um, so it might be stuff that happens for individuals in their lives, um, you know, personal circumstances, you know, shift. Um, transience is, is kind of an issue for a lot of organisations in terms of being able to collect information from people. And obviously, like, that's an indicator that stuff has happened for people and, they've, you know, they've had to move on. Um, so just things that can happen that can impact on that th that underpinning um, logic, that's what the external factors are. So the program logic is quite internally focused, right? It's focusing on the resources you have, the activities you can do with those resources, what stuff will come out of applying the resources in that way, and then what the short, medium and long-term outcomes are of having the stuff applied in that way. Um, there's always going to be stuff that we don't expect. Um, so that's kind of what external factors is trying to capture. Hopefully that makes sense. Any other questions that came through while we're no. Thank you, though. Please keep the questions coming. So I'm just skipping back uh, for those listening to a recording uh, to logic modeling growth. And stuff. Okay, so for teams learned new leadership skills, what, what answers did people get? Uh, 3A. 3A. Yeah, great. 3A. Yep, 3A. Oh, smart people. <laughs> so yeah, three A is a good one. Three A is a short term, um, a short term learning outcome. So we can see that teams learned new leadership skills here, um, and that's a short term outcome. Um, I I would just say like for example, if your um, if your entire organisation was oriented purely around teenagers learning leadership skills, and that was kind of your later outcome, then you might shift your logic um, based on you know what your ultimate impact is as an organisation. But yes, 3A is a very good answer to this one. What about for a new curriculum was developed? Two. 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 Yeah. Lots of twos. Yeah, absolutely. So um, two, so an output um, and more of an activity output than a participation output. 
Um, but yes, yeah, so that is um, the good, yeah, that's a good answer to that one. Yes, that is the official right answer. <laughs> well done. Um, what about C, students increase their confidence in negotiation skills? Oh, yep. 3C, 3A, 3B. Great. See, this is great. So a lot of these um, uh, statements assume or they may, they kind of push onto you to assume the context that's surrounding it, right? And that's why we can come up with different answers to these questions. So we had 3A, B and C in that response. So we had short-term learning outcome, medium-term action outcome and a long-term outcome, so an ultimate benefit kind of thing. Um, and that could be true based on what the context of this program is. So the right answer, and again, I'm doing the air quotes around the right answer, um, is 3A, which is the short-term learning outcome. Um, but again, you could kind of see how, you know, if they've increased in their confidence, yep, so that's a shift in how they feel about themselves. But if the entire, if that was the entire point, again, you might shift the logic to be able to fit other um, along the way points in along the way. Um, what about D, training programs included seminars and workshops? Two, two, one, two, two, two. Great, yeah. So two is the official correct answer, so that's the output, and this is, um, again, an activity output rather than a participation output. But you could also see how, depending on the context, it might be an input. Um, so the fact that, you know, the training programs included seminars and workshops, that could just be a description of an input for a particular kind of program. What about uh, E, parents from around the state attended? Lots of ones, twos, lots of twos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And once again, you could see how that could be one or two depending on the context. So the correct answer is two. Um, so it's an output. Again, it's a, oh, actually, no, this one's probably a participation output. Um, but it could be an input. So if you were thinking about, uh, you know, uh, something where the parents Something where you're not running it for the parents, like maybe it's something um, that's around parent mentoring and parents around the state attended to be mentored. It might actually be an input to the program. Sorry, they attended to be mentors. It might be an input to your program rather than being an output. What about F, operators applied new skills on the job? 3B, 3B, 2, 3B. Yeah, great. So 3B is the... Um, is the official kind of answer. Um, but two, yeah, two is a completely valid answer depending on the context of what we're talking about here. Um, so that could be seen as an output <clears throat> in terms of operating, operators are applying skills on the job for some other, you know, outcome. Uh, G, two agencies partnered to design the program. Two, one, two or three B. Awesome. Two, one. Yeah, great. I think the two or three B is a good example of what we're getting at here. So um, technically here it's a one, that's an input. Um, so but that, again, depends on the context. So two agencies have partnered to design a particular program. Um, if actually the entire point of whatever context we're talking about is to get people to partner and collaborate, that's actually probably 3B. Like it's an actual outcome that's action-oriented. Um, and it could also be an output. So, you know, let's say... Um, you know, it was a, I don't know, a matchmaking exercise for organisations to match them up and then two organisations partnered. Um, but the purpose was actually a bigger picture to, you know, foster collaboration. Um, it's an output. So it is highly contextual. Um, so I, it's great that we've got different answers to be able to flesh that out. I would usually flesh this out in the room a bit differently, but you've just got to listen to me at this point. Um, what about G ah, H? Volunteers provided over 300 hours of support. Um, one, one, two, one. Great. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So the, again, right answer, official answer, answer for recording purposes <laughs> is one, an input. Um, but if, if the purpose of the program or whatever it was was actually to start generating more volunteer hours, that could be an output of the project. Um, but here we've got input. Uh, so I, teen mentors were trained. 3A, 2, 2, 2. Yeah, great. Um, so, again, right answer 2, output, and I say right in air quotes. Uh, hopefully that's obvious by now. Um, but, you know, 3A is also completely valid depending on the context. It could be a learning kind of outcome. Yeah. Uh, J, owners learned how to develop a woodland management plan. Lots of 3As, lots of 3As. Great. 
yeah, that is uh, the answer, the right answer. Uh, I'm sure there's another context, but I, I will only flesh the context out if we've got differing answers for the sake of time. <laughs> um, K, sessions were held in 10 locations. One, two, 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 one. Great. So absolutely. So here we've got it as a two, as an output, uh, but it could also be a one. It could absolutely be an input. Um, we just don't have the context of the program or service or whatever it is to, to be clear about which. L, reported cases of abuse declined. Um, we've got 3C, 3C, 3B, 3C. 3C. Yeah, great. 3C. Um, so 3C is the answer here. But again, you know, 3B is a valid answer. If there's actually, if we're wanting um, cases of abuse to decline for another reason, then you can see that there's a step. It's a step along the way to the other thing, right? Uh, M, food safety skills were taught to food vendors. 2, 2, 3A, 2. Awesome. Yep. So here we've got two, but three A is also valid because obviously there's a short-term learning outcome there as well. Uh, and in some ways, honestly, I think the answer that, um, you know, God, who is it? University of Wisconsin. <laughs> so that's where I've taken the material from. Um, sometimes the way I think they've thought of the answer is just in how they framed the question, right? So um, in that one where it's food safety skills were taught to food vendors, it wasn't food vendors um, apply new mm -hmm. skills or something. It was framed like food safety skills were taught to food vendors. So, you know, sometimes the answer is just a question of framing. Um, and I hope that that once again just makes it how clear it is that we just, it's more about shared understanding with whoever we're articulating outcomes to and with, um, you know, than it is about kind of being quite purist about it. Um, and books were distributed to children. Two. Yep. Two, 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 two. Great. Two, two is what is here. Um, o, parents increase their employment skills. Two, just to clarify, the books would be the input. That must oh, sorry, for the books were distributed question. to children. Um, yes, yes. I think books would be the input, as would be, you know, staff time, uh, you know, maybe cars to travel to be able to take the books to children. So, yeah, there'd be a whole bunch of inputs into that um, if we were given the context we could flesh it out more but yes in the context that this is listed here in the right air quotes right answer as two uh, yeah books would be the input as well yeah um and then for the next question we have lots of three a's and lots of three c's yeah amazing um and sorry that was o wasn't it oh gosh i hope we're at o um after so books. yeah Yes, after books, yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, so the answer here is 3A, so a short-term learning outcome or short-term slash learning outcome, um, but it could absolutely be the ultimate benefit. The entire point is, well, in a sense, the entire point might be for people to get jobs, um, so learning employment skills is a step along the way. But once again, the context is really important. Um, greater percentage of high school students graduate? 3C, 3B. 3C, 3C. Yeah. yeah, great. So the answer here is 3C, um, but you could see how it might be one of the early ones, like a 3B, if actually the bigger context is, I don't know, like um, kids going on to study something um, or kids going on to, you know, get certain kinds of jobs or, you know, if it's a disciplinary sort of uh, logic that we're trying to create, that would be a step along the way. But here it is 3C, re recorded as 3C. Uh, we help the community assess the needs of families. Two, 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 two. Awesome. Yep, that's what we have here. Um, specialist educated business owners, blah, blah, blah. Two, Great. two, one, one, three, A. Ooh, yeah, two. lovely. Okay, so two is what's listed here. Absolutely could see how it might be um, a learning outcome as well, so the three, A. And once, even depending on the context, it could be an input. Um, so absolutely, they're all good answers. The one here is two. Um, S, youth serving agencies. Three, B. Nice. 3C. Yep. 3C. 3C. Yeah, 3C totally. 3A. And I think, like, yeah, absolutely. I think when, you know, we see how important collaboration is, we can see, like, that's an impact, right? Um, here they have 3B. So this is a kind of an action that's shifted along the way to some bigger picture. And, you know, again, in a very purist um, kind of outcome-focused Thing, that would be a collaboration would never be I guess the bigger picture outcome because for what purpose we're collaborating for what purpose so there is going to be a reason why we're collaborating we're never going to just be collaborating just cause um, so you know acknowledging that acknowledging it but just also saying you know contextually if we're trying to create a program logic it might suit us for that to be the impact 
um, teams established a team court and hear cases monthly. 203B, 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 3B, 3B. Yeah, lovely, 203B. Um, so here it's listed as 3B, but you can see how that could also be an output, teams establishing a teen court. And, you know, there's probably a world in which we can create that that would be an input. Maybe the teen court is actually an input to a much bigger picture. Uh, that's not a good wording. Much larger context, that's a better way of saying that. Um, three two-day workshops were conducted in each region. We're nearly there, guys. Two, 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 one, two. Nice. So two is what's listed here. Um, yeah, absolutely. It could also be an input. So if the, the workshops could be an input to, you know, what that, the program or service is actually trying to achieve. Newsletters are distributed in three languages. 3B, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Yeah, great. So two is listed here. Um, but it could be an outcome, again, depending on the context that we're talking about. 300 listeners per week tune into the radio broadcast. Two, 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 two. Yep, two, 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 two is what's listed here. Um, teens learn to counsel other teens. 3A, 3A, 3A. Bad, 3A. Yep, yep, that is what's listed here. Yeah, 3A. Um, why the town enacted a policy for youth coping? 3B, 3B2. Yeah, awesome. Um, so absolutely. So 3B is what's listed here, but it could actually be an output. If the purpose was something, you know, specific to do with young people, enacting the curfew might just be an output along the way to achieving that outcome. Um, and more kids walk to school. 3B. 3B, 3B, 3B. I think there's a 3C in there. How interesting. 3B or 3C. Yeah. So, again, the official right answer listed here is 3C, um, so a long-term ultimate benefit thing. But, you know, that's kind of like, I mean, not just contextual, but that's a bit of a values and philosophical mm. thing there too, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, so absolutely agree. It could be an action outcome on the way to a bigger picture, like why kids walk into school. Is walking to school in and of itself like a value and, you know, um, a kind of benefit or well, of course it is, um, but in this context, is there something more that we're looking for apart from just kids walking to school? And that would help you figure out where to place it in terms of your logic. Um, so I hope that was useful. I will send you the uh, the answers so that if you wanted to do it with your staff um, or within your organisation, you know, you can do that. I think it's just I use it um, either this or some of the other handouts that were sent to you. I use these a lot in my sessions, uh, workshops, just because it helps to create the conversation. And I know you've mostly just got me talking at you and about how I think the conversation would roll out if we were in the room. Um, but, you know, once again, if we're trying to create that shared understanding, being able to look at how different people see, you know, how these are framed and have that conversation is really worthwhile. So I'll make sure that's all distributed to you so you have it. Uh, any questions before we move on to the um, articulation and measurement? Sorry, moving on from articulation to measurement. Okay, cool. As, you know, as before, just keep typing and send them through. So this next part is actually going to address a question that we received uh, ahead of time, and that was um, there were a couple kind of framed around I'm interested in uh, what others use for measuring performance and tangible benefits. Um, and so what we've gone through so far in this session has been the articulation of outcomes and I guess in a sense the ordering or hierarchy of outcomes. Uh, this is going to go through the measurement of outcomes. So what's an outcomes measurement framework? It's a framework that effectively has orders and nests outcomes at different contexts and levels. So we're thinking both about the short, medium and long-term outcomes, but also that population service, organisational level and individual outcomes. And in my head, and, you know, you don't have to con conceive of it in the, exactly the same way. I just thought I'd share this because it helps me. I kind of think of it in my head as a bit of a matrix. So you've got short, medium, long term, and then you've got different aggregations of outcomes. Um, and, you know, at any point in time, I kind of think about where we are. Um, and if we're moving in one, in one direction or another, um, you know, you can just be clear about where you are and where you're moving to. And I think sometimes that's the whole difficulty in outcomes is just having clarity around what you're articulating right now um, and where you're moving it to, and then when you're trying to pull frameworks together or, you know, articulate it to someone else who's not currently speaking the same common language, um, how you articulate to them. Um, an outcomes measurement framework ideally provides all of the tools, materials and definitions and all the things um, that you would need to measure outcomes. 
Uh, this is actually a draft of a project that we at Wacos are working on with the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, so we're looking at a whole of WA outcomes measurement framework. Now this one is a very, very early draft. Um, we've moved on to prototype four <laughs> at this point. Um, but the idea behind the framework is to provide a whole of, uh, eventually a whole of government, but at this point a whole of human services sector sort of um, measurement framework. And so what the framework's intended do is in a sense provide not quite the source of truth but maybe the north star um, for where uh, population level outcomes for Western Australia are sitting and how at, uh, at a department level, at an organisational level um, or at some other level um, we're mapping in and mapping up towards these kind of shared agreed upon population level outcomes. Uh, the idea of an outcomes hierarchy or outcomes framework isn't new, so most other jurisdictions, including in, in Australia, have them. We've drawn really heavily on a lot of them, so uh, New South Wales, in particular Victoria, we've spent quite a lot of time looking at and uh, pulling from their frameworks, um, but also Canada, Tasmania, uh, there's some kind of you know smaller level ones in the United States that we've pulled from, uh, New Zealand and Scotland, so there's quite a lot of jurisdictional uh, information that's gone into developing this one, which is great because, uh, as I'm sure none of you are <laughs> um, disfamiliar with, there's not a lot of resourcing available to do the work. So being able to pull on where other resourcing has been uh, deployed is really useful for us. Um, the framework is person-centred. Sorry for those listening, I've gone on to the next um, slide. It's called About the Framework. Um, so it is person-centred. So if you have a look at these at these um, domains, we are safe and free from harm. We have suitable and stable homes. So it's it's um, focused on the person. Yeah, was a question? Okay, good question. Yeah. Would you get the baselines at the beginning of the implementation? Would the baselines be statewide? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, ongoing conversation at the moment. Uh, so we... Uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to think. I think I might address this question in a couple of slides' time. It just makes a bit more logic. So I'll come. Yeah. More logic than words. It's not a good use of words. <laughs> uh, it makes more sense uh, for me to address that in a couple of slides. Uh, so the domain areas are outcomes in and of themselves. So if I think about these domain areas, so we are healthy and well, that's not just a domain that in and of itself is an outcome. Um, it loosely follows Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So for those that would have, you know, had experience with Maslow's, maybe back at university days, um, but this idea of having, uh, I guess, the key needs taken care of before looking at the desires. Um, so it kind of loosely follows that, safe, stable, healthy, uh, and of course equipped. I'm testing, uh, equipped, connected and empowered. So it kind of loosely follows that. Um, it is high level outcomes and indicators only. So the framework will focus really mostly at that very high level. Um, and the Premier's priorities, which are some key state government ministerial targets, have also been incorporated. It has been mapped to the sustainable development goals and the framework is in no way intended to replace anything that exists. So other frameworks um, and, you know, like WA Health has an outcomes framework, uh, WAFA has an outcomes framework, uh, there's an Aboriginal health and wellbeing framework, so it's not intended to replace any of those. It's just to, in a sense, provide the scaffolding or the architecture or the infrastructure um, that those things can hang off. <clears throat> uh, so this is just an example of mapping other areas' uh, outcomes into the framework, and I won't dwell on this too much because I'll make sure you have these slides and the materials afterwards. Um, and this is just a snapshot of the our priorities. It is no longer embargoed. It's just I couldn't find a one pager that looked as good as this one. So um, I've taken it from a previous uh, document. But these are the WA state government priority areas. If you're interested in learning more about these, you can find them at www.ourpriorities.wa.gov.au. These are kind of the focuses for the state government. Um, and yeah, I won't go into those in depth either, but just to let you know that they exist and they've been mapped to the framework. And this is an example of WA Health's framework. Uh, yep. Oh, okay, so I thought I had another slide and I don't. Um, so what I wanted to say um, was in terms of the baseline question. So there's this other election commitment that's happening alongside. Uh, 
Sorry. Yeah. Um, I will type the website into the box. They're looking. They're, what's the the government priorities? Oh yeah. Website. Yes. Can I link it? Um, you could link it. But okay. You can type it into whatever you want. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Look it up. You go ahead. Sure. I'll do that. Just, yeah. Okay. Uh, so Leela's going to type the link in there. Um, for our priorities. Uh, but yeah, so in terms of the baseline, there's another election commitment happening at the same time called the Our Communities Report. So um, state government's looking at how do we talk to communities about what they actually want to know about communities and create a report. We've kind of moved away from report. It's a bit more of a dialogue, a dialogue between state government and community um, about the communities they live in. Right? So what we're envisaging is hopefully over time these two would come together. So in a sense, the our community's consultation or engagement or whatever it looks like um, is actually in the domains of the outcomes framework. And effectively that initial or first consultation would draw on what communities want to know. It would be testing the domains with them, but it would also be asking, you know, what kind of how you feel about the community you're in. And what kind of things you would like to be, I guess, in conversation with the state government about. So in a sense, I think the Our Communities Report can provide a bit of a baseline for this. Um, so, yeah, that kind of answers the question. But to be quite honest, the, um, our community's work is still pretty early days. So it's, um, yeah, it's an ongoing discussion about implementation. OK, I've got another question here. How will this link to Aboriginal affairs and close the gap and the empowered communities model on Aboriginal engagement in remote areas? Yeah, absolutely. So I have about five different, and closing the gap is one of them, five different Aboriginal health and wellbeing frameworks that I am currently mapping into the framework. Um, the idea, I guess, in what I'm doing with this mapping process is making sure that, you know, Communities can be over consulted, right? So making sure that any time we've already gone to communities about um, outcomes, uh, they are already mapped into this framework. So I'm trying to, I guess, leverage the collective experience of everyone who's ever been involved in creating a framework that we now currently work on. I'm closing the gap, and I think there's four other different frameworks, but I honestly just can't remember them off the top of my head. There's one called the Broom Model. Um, I think I got one from Yaru, the Yaru Mob. Um, I think, yeah, I just can't remember them all. Sorry, guys. So, but I can definitely make that available to show you the ones that we're working on. Um, and in terms from um, uh, Aboriginal governance isn't the right word, but um, in terms of Aboriginal engagement, um, this project is a supporting communities forum priority area. So we have, um, there's Aboriginal people that sit at supporting communities forum. And then we have a working group that governs this work and there's Aboriginal people that sit on that one as well. Um, so I hope that we, we've captured perspectives being very, very cognizant that, um, you know, mobs around the state have different uh, needs and priorities and desires and, and things. So acknowledging I'm not fully covering off that at the moment. Um, I think we've got, you know, some as much probably as we can do right at this moment. But I really appreciate any other suggestions feedback and things. So what I'll do is make sure I distribute everything about um, the framework because if you come to one of my specialised sessions about the framework um, and I appreciate any connections, feedback, etc. you can provide. Okay, so just in response to that, mm. uh, yes, please, if you can share the baseline, I have a specific interest in Aboriginal reform and measurement. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm not sure we'll have a baseline. Yeah. Because um, so that was kind of the point around the our community report potentially doing that that work around the baseline. But I can definitely make sure that the um the inputs that are going into this project can be shared with you, so you can give any other feedback or input. Thank you. Um, so I'll move on, but keep sending the questions through. I should have realised uh you know timing. I always want to tell you everything, <laughs> so um I'm trying to do that. Um. I might skip over these. This is just a little bit of a uh, looking at the difference between monitoring and evaluation. Actually, I won't skip over it because it's kind of important. Um, so there's complementary roles between monitoring, measuring, and evaluation. So evaluation is usually a point in time, understanding of how we're going against outcomes or whatever it is we're looking at. Um, and monitoring is a thing that you kind of do along the way, right? Um, there's also this perception that evaluation looks at is the project doing the right things and monitoring is a bit more is the project doing things right. I think once again, like that's very true if we're looking at the rigorous, you know, academic kind of perspective and way of seeing things. But I think sometimes monitoring can be looking at is the project doing things right, like it kind of measurement along the way, right, rather than measurement at a point in time. Um, so just 
being clear, I guess, that yes, that these definitions exist and that distinction is often between monitoring, looking at is the project doing things right and evaluation, looking at is the project doing the right things, um, but that you can also do measurement along the way. And I'm just going to skip this one, but you'll have the slide. And if you have any questions, I'm happy for you to contact me. So where we're going now is into um, just a snapshot, a very high level overview of the kind of methodologies. And it's good learning for me that I'm, I've been quite leisurely in the front end and maybe this actually needs to be two hours long. Um, but we've got the logic model, right? So we've articulated our outcomes. Theoretically, we've then measured our outcomes and we've got maybe an impact evaluation. So we've got that point in time evaluation as well. Although I don't think that's necessary. What this slide's trying to tell us is you need to measure outcomes with some kind of methodology first before you can conduct an economic evaluation. And all an economic evaluation is, is it's kind of tacking on a dollar figure to stuff. So sometimes it's called a cost effectiveness analysis or a cost benefit analysis or social return on investment, kind of small SROI, um, not capital letter SROI. These things effectively do something along the lines of for every dollar invested in this program, you get $2.47 financial, I mean, sorry, <laughs> social return. So every dollar invested, $2.47 social return. So it kind of finds a way to make, um, you know, measuring outcomes very, it applies a financial proxy um, to measuring of outcomes. You can't do that unless you've measured the outcomes with the methodology. So I just want to be really clear about that. Um, applying kind of a cost effectiveness analysis or benefit analysis is an extra step. Um, you can't kind of use that to measure outcomes, right? So this slide, so we've moved on to the next slide. Um, it has figure 0 0.2 at the front for anyone listening on the recording. So what this slide does is says to us at different stages of uh, measuring outcomes or the life cycle of a project, different kinds of methodologies will be more useful. So, for example, if we take social return on investment, which is the top one of this diagram, social return on investment is useful for estimating impact. It's not, it, that dollar figure, though, doesn't give you a way to plan impact. You can't plan impact with SROI. It does give you a way to monitor and evaluate impact as well. Um, but it's just worth noting that you can't plan with SROI. And then the logic model, which we've just talked about, really good for estimating impact and for planning impact. But unless you attach other things to a program logic model, so unless you attach indicators to the outcomes, unless you have a way of understanding what's shifting with those outcomes, unless you have something more, I guess, than the program logic, that's not going to measure your outcomes. It articulates them and, you know, it's a good structure for doing that, but it's not measurement. Um, and then the others there you'll see, um, yeah, there's different ways of doing it and different times at which they're useful. So uh, it's just to say that at any point in time, or depending on your context and the kind of program or service you're looking at measuring, you might need to layer a few different approaches or methodologies to get the best impact. So results-based accountability is the first one we're going to touch on. And I am sorry because I'm going to um, go through these a little bit quickly, probably a little bit more quickly than I'd like to. But if you do have any questions about them, you know, keep recording them. And even if you email me questions afterwards, I'm more than happy to help. So results-based accountability is um, quite a good tool for looking at measuring outcomes. It kind of looks at the outcomes in terms of population and performance. Um, so what we're doing at a whole population level and what we're doing at a client population level in terms of the programs, agencies and service systems. RBA, um, actually, the resources are freely available online. So, uh, you know, if you Google results-based accountability, uh, Mark Friedman, um, I'm sure it's Mark Friedman, um, you, the, all the resources are freely available. It's just that many organisations that have implemented RBA have got um, a resource or some external support or an internal resource to do it for them. So even though the, all the resources are freely available, um, you know, sometimes it can be useful to have an external resource to help you put them together for your organisation. Um, so we've gone on to the next slide, which has results-based accountability at the top. So RBA effectively asks three questions and it attaches um, ways of understanding those three questions, indicators and things to each of the three. So it's how much did we do, how well did we do it, and is anyone better off? And what I really like about RBA is that um, 
it, it looks at the quality more than some other methodologies do. So um, this element of how well did we do it, um, so how much did we do and is anyone better off is covered off by pretty much all methodologies, right? Um, and in, a, in the program logic sense, in terms of the articulation, how much do we do is, is the outputs and is anyone better off as the outcomes, right? Um, how well did we do it is not something that all approaches and methodologies cover off well. And I like that. I like that quality element that's inserted with RBA. Um, so this one, and for those listening to the recording, a, a little image has just popped up on a transition uh, thing. Um, so the decision making, this demonstrates how you use RBA to inform your decision making process. Um, so you've got a population, and in this example, it's children prenatal to age five. Um, what you want to achieve, the outcomes, or they're using results here, and kind of in lieu of outcomes, is that children enter school healthy and ready to learn, right? Um, so then you've got, you know, the service and the experience. Um, you've got indicators and baseline of where that's currently at. Um, you might have a story behind the baseline. So stories are something that some methodologies and approaches leverage quite a lot and some, you know, so-so. Um, you've got partners that have a role to play. Um, you know, you've got what works, criteria, and then that feeds into your action plan and budget, which then feeds back into your indicators as you as you're measuring things. And so, in a sense, with RBA, what kind of spits out is a, a, a report. And um, people who implement RBA talk about turning the curve. So you get a report of how you're doing against, um, you know, working with children prenatal to age five, and you know, getting them healthy and ready to to be able to attend school and actually learn. Um, and you look at how you're turning the curve. And if you look closely at the baseline, where it says baseline, you've got the trend where it is and what you're targeting. And so that's the turning of the curve. How are we moving from where the trend is um, to up to, you know, the target of what we're looking for? Um, I've also talked to organisations that have used kind of like a form of RBA. So, again, it's not, it's not really about being purist, but they've applied the principles of RBA in a sense rather than applying RBA in its like, you know, pure kind of form. Um, and I think there are some good principles, like the questions, the framing, the framing, what did we do, how well did we do it, is anyone better off? Like it's simple and I think that's really useful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so any questions on RBA? So we're just flying over a couple of different approaches and methodologies, right? The most significant change is a bit more of a storytelling method of um, understanding outcomes and impact. Um, and so the example that we've got up here on the slide is actually from International Aid and Development. So it's used quite extensively in that, uh, I guess, in that context, in that sector. The idea is that um, committees of people collect stories of change from clients or people, consumers, whatever we want to call them, people who've accessed your service, right? And you collect stories and there's a bunch of different committees and particularly in international aid, there's, you know, many countries collecting these stories sometimes. Um, at different offices, and they kind of funnel up um, into selection committees, um, and then they would, you know, uh, reduce the number of stories and then funnel up again. And so eventually, you get uh, uh, the idea is that you end up with one to three kind of stories that fully, almost fully articulate the kind of impact that your service has. Now, most significant change is an interesting one because I would usually say that this sort of approach, you, you would have it alongside something else. Um, but it's interesting because, um, I mean, many of you are probably aware that Lottery West has just gone through the process of um, creating an investment framework and then applying um, indicators to, to that investment framework, right? Um, but a few years ago, I forget how many, Lottery West actually used most significant change to talk about their impact. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense because Lottery West, in terms of um, providing grants, all different kinds of grants <laughs> to all different kinds of organisations, it's hard to find the inherent logic behind that sometimes. So this is something that a very, very diversified and organisation like Lottery West kind of makes sense for them. Um, so I think that's all I had on most significant change. Yeah, just a brief flyover. So just knowing MSC, mostly storytelling and finding the critical stories. Um, that tell you tell you the story about what's happening with a client or consumer or whoever, whatever it would be. Um, yeah. Any questions come through? No. Nope. Okay. Social return on investment is what I touched on before. Uh, so you can say small SROI, so small letter SROI, non-capitalised SROI, um, is kind of a, a, a 
describes a broad set of methodologies, right? And which also have those other words that we talked about, like economic evaluation, social benefit analysis, whatever we want to call them. Capital SROI is a specific methodology um, that is underpinned, as is most significant change, by a set of principles that govern how you use it. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the principles that underpins SROI is the clarity of assumptions, which I think I talked about before. So it's, I think that's 10 principles, and um, being clear about assumptions is one of the really critical ones. So the idea with SROI is it's effectively a big Excel spreadsheet, and it's kind of got, um, I don't know, a, a way, a methodology of applying a financial proxy alongside attribution, causation, and dead weight. Um, so it's kind of a structured spreadsheet that kind of allows for, has formulas behind it that allow for those issues around causation and attribution that we talked about before. Um, and the way that you come up with the impact, right, is purely by talking to people. So you talk to the clients, consumers, and people that have worked with the service, and you keep interviewing people until you start to hear the same themes coming up over and over again. Um, so I really like that because I like that the articulation of impact is driven by the people. Um, I think that's really good. Um, I do have some, some philosophical concerns with applying a financial a dollar value to um, things that we do in social impact. So, like, I totally think it's worthwhile, and I think it should be it should be um, something that we use, but I just think we should use it in combination with other approaches um, and as part of a, a balanced and mixed approach to measuring impact or understanding impact. So as mentioned before, this is the kind of thing where it will spit out at the end, for every dollar you invest, you create $12.05 of social return. Um, so that's what an SROI does, that's the final product of it. Um, Quasi-experimental and experimental methods are, uh, you know, one of those very, how do you say, um, like academic rigorous kind of approaches. What does TV and IV stand for oh, sorry, in yeah. SROI? Oh my goodness. Guys, I really apologise. You're about to have the fire alarm uh, come on. Oh. We've just told it's going to be tested. So. We, we might just see if it's one of those very soft tests, and if it is, I'll keep talking. If it's going to be really loud, um, we might mute ourselves so you don't have to put up with that. Um, but it's okay at the moment, so we'll keep going. So, yeah, sorry, TV and IV. So um, value to the community, tangible value is things. Um, do you know what? Just in the spirit of making sure that this um, isn't going to be interrupted and I get to the end, what I'm going to do is I've got a really useful um, – Oh, like a kind of a little training package around SROI that describes this um, in a, quite a lot of detail. Um, and I think I even have an Excel spreadsheet of what it practically looks like. Here it goes. So I'm going to distribute that to you, all right? I'm going to make sure I do that. Um, can you? Can someone type to Leela how loud that is for you? How are we going? Can you hear that? And is it too loud or should I just keep going? It's all good. We're it's all good? okay. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, we've got the whoop uh, right now. Yeah. <laughs> if we, I'm just going to keep talking, guys, and if it gets too hard, just type to Leela and we'll, and we'll finish it up. We're nearly there anyway, right? Um, the last thing I want to touch on in terms of methodologies is, yes, we've got these kind of more official ways of thinking about measuring outcomes, um, but you can kind of just choose your own adventure in a sense. So um, if you have... Uh, outcomes. So you've got your outcomes that you've articulated through your logic model. If you can attach indicators to those, um, you have a definition of the clients, the relevant clients that you're working with. If you've got performance targets for each measure, and you know, to be honest, you don't um, necessarily need performance targets. That's just kind of like a nice to have. And if you have a data source, so you know where you can get the data and you've got a plan to collect that data, you can kind of just fit these puzzle pieces together in a way that makes sense to you. Um, and that was actually another question that we had ahead of time. It was in, um, someone was interested in the methods for linking purpose, processes, and performance outcomes, or if it's just a matter of logic and common sense. And I guess it's kind of inherent in the name of program logic. <laughs> Some of it is, you know, just logic and common sense. Um, and, you know, being clear about your assumptions so that other people can test your assumptions, that's really important. Um, and I guess that's what I'm saying here is, yeah, like it's, it's a bit of logic. 
Ideally, your logic is informed by evidence. So just remembering that again, like your theory of change is informed by evidence. But otherwise, linking those things is mostly a matter of like, common sense. So if you can attach indicators to each of these things, and I've got this diagram up just to give you a bit of an indicator. So I get a lot of people ask, oh, but how many indicators should I have for each outcome? In a sense, it depends. I know um, I'm saying that a lot, but it does depend a lot on the context. Um, it kind of depends on, uh, you know, yeah. it depends on your context. But I think in general, if you have one to three indicators that help you determine the flavor of the longer term outcomes, and three to five indicators helping you think about the short-term outcomes, that's going to give you enough data to make some sorts of um, conclusions about how you're, how you're tracking in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Um, this is my last slide, so I'll just touch on it really briefly. So as I just mentioned, you can do it yourself and come up with your own indicators, but I think the value, there's a lot of value in consistency. And to be quite honest, there's a lot of outcome banks and indicator banks that exist. So kind of like what I'm trying to create for, um, you know, the, the, the one we talked about, the WA um, outcomes measurement framework, there's a lot of them out there. And I'm positive that whatever you're working in, you'll be able to find something that has information that's useful to you. Um, so I've noted a couple of banks up there. Um, Issue Lab used to be known as TRASI, which is Tools and Resources for Assessing Social Impact, I think. Um, Perform Well is another one, and obviously soon this Outcomes Measurement Framework, which is taking from a whole bunch of other Outcomes Measurement Frameworks that people have sent me, um, so it will have quite a lot in it. But, yeah, I would just find things that exist and pull the things in that are useful for you. Um, so find things that are generally accepted in your field. Um, actually, I'd tell a lie. I think I've got one more slide after this which will demonstrate that one a bit more. Um, and just noting there's more rigorous and less rigorous methods of collecting information. So um, I think it was a reader before who said that their triage tool is mostly based on like observation. So whoever's welcomed the client in, worked with them, um, provides observation on where they're at. So they can kind of help use that to articulate where they're going. That's right. I have other slides on this, and maybe I'll just send you the expanded deck anyway, but that's probably a less rigorous method because it's not coming directly from the client. The more rigorous ones are, you know, your surveys and your interviews, um, outcome stars, you know, kind of tools that you use to get that information directly from the people that we're working with. But noting the constraints we have, sometimes we need to use less rigorous methods, um, and that's totally okay. Um, so this slide is... So this is uh, for those on the recording, Australian Mental Health Outcomes and Classification Network, blah, blah, blah. It's a slide with two tables on it. This is, yeah, Australian Mental Health Outcomes and Classification Network. So this is how they describe the, I guess, the domains on the side. What's on the right-hand side then is the kinds of tools um, that they use to collect that information that this sector uses. Um, and I think that's really useful because it's kind of, you know, telling you either tools or questionnaires, survey examples of, of what's used to help understand each of those domains. Um, and so it's useful to just see what your sector uses if you're not already across it um, and see what you might be able to use. Or, you know, if it's not Australian, you know, look at other jurisdictions. That is all the slides. So my apologies for skipping over that last bit a little bit quickly. Um, but, and I'm very thankful that the fire alarm didn't go all the way to woot woo, which is great. Uh, are there any additional questions at all? Um, not so much. No, just Kelsey Donovan's going to email you at a later date. Great. Um, yeah, no. Happy, happy to receive emails at later dates, everybody. Yeah, cool. Okay, and I will, um, so the... Great overview. Great, thank you. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to do here is provide you a bit of an overview to the concepts. Um, you can delve into each of these a lot in a lot more um, depth, um, either, you know, with Waco stuff or others. Like the Centre for Social Impact runs a two-day outcomes measurement training. Um, so, you know, there's other things and providers out there that you can leverage and uh look at. Um, but yeah, I will send you what I've promised. So all of the outcomes measurement framework uh, materials and also that further information about social return on investment uh, about, yeah, about the, all the tangible and intangible things because there's quite a list of the things that are grouped in each of those categories. So I think it would just be useful to show you. Them. Um, and I will ensure that a link 
to the to the webinar goes out to the Wacos Bulletin and the CRR broadcast once it's available. Awesome. Thanks, Leila. And thanks, everyone, for your questions and for your participation in terms of that, the logic model lingo exercise. Um, yeah, and as I say, I'll send everything out. But if you have any questions, please feel free to email them through. Um, yeah, thank you.